All right. Well, welcome everybody this evening. I do appreciate you being here. I know it's not easy to find the time. So I do want to be mindful of your time and give you what you need to get started for the RECA. First of all, my name is Emily Muchanti. I am a reading specialist. I am a former reading interventionist, bit of a reading diva, and I have been helping teachers, supporting teachers since about 2016 for the RECA. And this all started when one of my son's teachers reached out to me. We were working in the same district. I was at the elementary school. She was at a different site. And she said, you know, Emily, I can't pass the RECA. And I said, the what? I had never heard of it because back when I was getting my credential in the early 1990s, this was not a, a thing for us. So I started tutoring her out of my home and long story short, she passed the RECA. And through that, I learned a couple of things. I learned, first of all, that there was very little out there as far as reliable resources to help teachers prepare for the RECA. And I also learned that what the RECA was asking new teachers to do was everything that I was living and breathing every day while I was teaching intervention. And so I started hosting workshops out of my classroom on weekends. And once a month, I would have our teachers across the valley. I was in um, Madera, Fresno, Madera area at the time, and they would come to my classroom and spend an afternoon with me so that I could help prepare them for the RECA. The current RECA, um, RECA Prep 101, the course that I created, really came to be in about 2020 because I was getting calls up and down the state of California for more and more people to join me, and I knew I had to, had to increase my reach. And so I did that for a long time, finally went online, and my family, we moved to Boise, Idaho about three and a half years ago, and when I left the classroom after 27 years. And so this is what I do. Um, I support teachers with the RECA. I also coach and consult with schools and reading interventionists to help them create really robust and effective reading intervention programs. So the mission that I have for RECA Prep 101 is really to make sure that I can help to prepare you for the RECA by giving you a step-by-step -step process that is going to help you eliminate the overwhelm. I know this is, it's exhausting, it feels like a lot, and it's very much like a foreign language. So we want to reduce that overwhelm. But more importantly than that, I approach things a little bit differently, and that is my primary goal in helping support you in the RECA is to make sure that as a new teacher, you are well-equipped and knowledgeable in order to teach your students how to read. It is the single most important thing that you are ever going to do, um, and I believe it is really a, a something important for me having those skills to be able to pass that along to you. Um, I think that it helps us to function as a a working society and we know that so many challenges with our adults in society are linked to illiteracy and I want to help you to reduce that risk. So you are in the right place if you've never taken the RECA before and you're just getting started, but you're also in the right place if you have taken it but you haven't passed. And especially to those of you that are special ed teachers, you are feeling probably like the RECA is completely baffling. Um, it is very much like a, a, a new language to you, and it's not your fault. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. So I want to give you some announcements before we begin, just kind of some timely announcements. This is as of November 2024. We know that the RECA in its current state is retiring um, June 30th of 2025. That will be the last date that you will be able to take and pass the RECA exam. It is being replaced by something called the Literacy Performance 
um, assessment or performance task. I see a typo there. Um, the LPA, the Literacy Performance Assessment. And this is really a revision of the cycle two of the Cal TPA. They are going through pilots with this coming up this spring. And the goal is that universities are going to have to align their courses and their credential programs to meet the needs of your of our candidates and then the LPA becomes the competency assessment for that. So what that means for you, since you're already in the program, is that you have 225 days left. That is it. The RECA is gone after 225 days. I have a countdown running on my website at recaprep101.com. If you ever are curious how, how much time you need or have left, you can visit that. But county offices the um, district offices are all really strongly urging their teacher candidates to pass the RECA, and that's for a couple of things for one when a new test comes in we don't know what it actually is all about and there are no supports and resources available for quite a while in order to help people. So we know the RECA, we have a number of resources to support that. So again, the recommendation is get it done, get it done as quickly as you can so that you are not lost in that transition. I don't know what that me will mean for your credential program. Those will be questions that you will have to ask your universities or your county offices. Now, one other really important note is that there is something called um, testing accommodations for the RECA, which means that you can actually um, qualify for receiving extended time when you take the RECA. So I'm gonna drop a link in the chat, but you can find this on the CDC website. It falls under the alternative testing arrangement. So here's a link that I'll tell you a little bit about this. Some testing candidates will be able to get extended time under certain qualifying conditions. Some of those conditions that I know qualify are if English is not your primary language, there is documentation that you can read up on, on the, um, in the link that I sent you. If you have a documented learning disability like dyslexia, if you have a medical condition that may cause you to need extended time, attention deficit disorder, anxiety, all of those things have qualified people for receiving time and a half, which means for subtest one and two, you can get an extra 35 minutes and on subtest three, you can get an extra 45 minutes. My recommendation is that if you think you may qualify for that additional time, apply. It is free to apply. You get an answer within um, between a week and one to three weeks. And um, it's really going to help reduce your anxiety just knowing that you have that additional time. Again, that link is in the chat. So make sure that you check that out when you have some additional time. Now, I always like for you to evaluate whether or not you consider yourself an advantaged test taker or a disadvantaged test taker. And I do this because I think it's important for you to know what you are up against. You've all heard the rumors about the RECA. It is a challenging test. It has, from what I understand, one of the lowest first time pass rates um, at about 68% for the written and about 50% for the video option. But some of you will be more advantaged and some will be more disadvantaged. So I want you to think about this. The advantage test takers are those of you that may have gone straight to college, knowing you wanted to be a teacher, you were a liberal studies major, and so a lot of your content has woven in the requirements of the RECA, and so that might help give you an advantage. If you are elementary trained, 
Um, maybe you have been a paraprofessional in a classroom. You've volunteered extensively in your children's classroom. You may be an intern. You might have been a long-term sub. Those kinds of things will give you an advantage. Disadvantaged test takers, our number one disadvantaged group is our special education teachers. And this is not your fault. Sadly, our special ed programs, at least the majority that I am aware of, do not adequately prepare our SPED teachers for teaching reading, which is really ironic because some of the most struggling readers in our dyslexic students are going to be on IEPs. And unfortunately, the programs at the university level do not build in enough content for you to understand how reading develops and how you can best teach those particular learners. They do a great job teaching you about the legalities and the testing and those kinds of things, but there are some serious holes. Again, not your fault. If English is not your primary language, you are at a disadvantage, mostly because of the time constraints of the RECA. Um, it takes a lot of time and and you having to, if you're still kind of translating some of that information and it takes you a little bit longer to process, that can put you at a disadvantage. If you have test anxiety, obviously that would give you a disadvantage. And if you work with students, but you're more at the upper grades, the upper elementary, middle school area, um, you will also have a slight disadvantage. And that is because a lot of the content that the RECA covers is related to early literacy, especially for domain two. That's going to be more challenging for you. Now, before we go on, what I'd like you to do is you've heard me mention this. I want you to drop into the chat. Where do you see yourself? Are you more advantaged or are you more disadvantaged? What do you think, You where do you think you would fall into that? Go ahead and drop that into the chat for me. Yeah, that's kind of, you know, usually what we, we get a lot of disadvantaged more um, because you probably have tried this and haven't had much luck. And so you're finding out, uh, okay, this is a little bit challenging. So yes. Um, all right. Thank you for that. Now, again, I don't do it to scare you, but I want to give you, I am a realist and I want you to know exactly what you're up against. So one thing to consider is the approach that you have taken in the past. If you are a past test taker and have not found success, you need to look at how you're preparing. Are you just memorizing terminology? Are you going on Quizlet and memorizing a bunch of definitions? By the way, I've been to Quizlet and not all of that is accurate, so be very careful there. Um, are you just taking the CDC practice exam? The CDC practice exam will give you a false sense of security. That practice exam is far easier than what you are actually going to see on the RECA. Unfortunately, that's just the way what they've given you. I don't know why. Or have you found other practice tests? And again, you're still just focusing on terminology and taking a bunch of practice exams. If you are focused on just the terminology and the practice exams, let me be clear, that is important. We have to know the terminology and you do need to take practice exams. But if that is your entire focus, that is not going to get you there. You have to focus on learning the content because no matter what question comes up on the multiple choice, you have to take what you know about that content and you have to apply the knowledge to the question. You're not going to be able to see a bunch of sample questions and that are going to have the same situation. So you have to learn the content. The other thing, are you just asking other people what's on the RECA, what's on the RECA? That is not effective. These are when you rely on the recollections of past test takers who were in a very stressful situation, not a good idea. Definitely not. So if this has predominant, if any of these have predominantly been the way that you have approached this, I'm going to tell you to stop right now because I'm going to give you a better way, a more effective way to do this that's actually going to get you on 
get you to the finish line. But before we go into that, I want to cover what the RECA actually, um, the content of the RECA. So the RECA is broken down into five domains. And these five domains are split off into three different subtests. And we're going to go through each of these just a little bit more in detail so that you can see what they incorporate. Within each domain, there are a number of different competencies. So domain one is all about planning, organizing, and managing reading instruction based on assessment. And there are two competencies here for this. It's the planning and the organizing and the managing part of it, which is all about your pedagogy, how, you, how your best practices for doing these things. And we get into this a great deal. And the other competency is about reading assessment, being able to um, analyze assessment data in order to determine the best course of uh, the best instructional course of action for a struggling student. Now, let me say this domain one is actually a part of subtest three. This is not where I want you to start your studies. We actually save domain one for the end. We save it for the end because domain one is going to include content from all of the other domains. So we're gonna put this one on the very end. It is a part of subtest three. We start our studies with domain two. This is word analysis, and this is by far the heaviest, most challenging domain um, of all of them. There is more questions, more content in this domain than any other domain. What else is challenging about this one is that we are looking developmentally at kids from TK, preschool, all the way to middle school. There's a lot of developmental stages that are happening from the reading standpoint within this domain. So there are actually five competencies. The first is all about phonological and phonemic awareness. And if you're like most people, those two terms are confusing and you may be not quite sure how to separate those and what the differences are. We cover all of that. Concepts of print, letter recognition, and the alphabetic principle. This is all early literacy uh, and literacy readiness that we cover. Competency five is all about the phonics and sight words and the terminology and concepts related to that, while competency six moves into how do we teach it and how do we assess for it. And then the final competency number seven is the syllabic analysis, structural analysis, and orthographic knowledge of these really big words, right? It's about how do we teach and how kids to read multisyllabic words. So that's where we get into the older students working with some more complex types of skills. Com um, domain three is all about fluency, oral reading fluency. There are only two competencies here related to this. You will learn the role that fluency plays in the development of reading and what can affect fluency development, and also how do you teach it and how do we assess for it. All of these are a part, again, of subtest one. So domain two and domain three is where you start your studying, okay? That is the best place to begin. Now, you can start with domain one to kind of get an idea, but you do not test on that one. You test these in order, subtest one, subtest two, subtest three. Trust me, again, this falls under that do what I say because I've done it for so long, I know what can work here. Now, subtest two begins with domain four, which is all about vocabulary, academic language, and background knowledge. Make a note that this particular domain is really heavy in questions related to English learners. Our English learners really struggle with this particular area. And so you'll be, you need to be ready for that as you are preparing to test. And what we do here is what role do these things play in reading development? What affects it? And then again, how do we teach it? And how do we assess for it? Domain five 
is the other part of subtest two, and this is all related to comprehension. We talk first in competency 12 about the concepts and factors that affect reading comprehension. So it's more reading comprehension from a broad standpoint. And then we look at what we can do throughout the reading process to actually teach students how to strengthen comprehension and how we can assess for it. And then competency 14 looks specifically at instruction related to narrative text um, and literary text and competency 15 looks specifically at informational and expository text. So again, domain one is a part of subtest three, domains two and three comprise subtest one and domains four and five comprise subtest three, two. Yes, <laughs> sometimes I start to confuse myself. There's so many numbers. All right, so it looks like this. Within each domain or within each subtest, this is the multiple choice breakdown. There are 27 multiple choice questions related to domain two and only eight related to domain three. You can see why domain two is so important. This is absolutely the most important part of subtest one. There are also two constructed questions, constructed responses, written questions. There's a mid-sized constructed response and there is a short constructed response. And you have 75 minutes to complete that. So that's 35 multiple choice questions and two constructed responses. Now, the same breakdown is, it's almost the same for domain, I'm sorry, subtest two. Domain four, there are 19 multiple choice questions. And for domain five, there are 16. Again, you have two constructed responses and you have 75 minutes to complete that. Subtest three, which goes back to domain one, there are a whopping 25 questions on domain one, but again, you have to have some knowledge of all of these other domains because it could be related to that. And there is also the case study. The case study is a written response, which is 300 to 600 words, where you are presented with anywhere from six to 10 pieces of assessment data or testing information that you would look through and analyze, and then you would write up a, um, a plan for what you would do for this student based on the needs that the data are showing. Now, something else to note here, 80% of your test score, please write this down, 80% of your test score comes from the multiple choice in every single subtest. 80%. So you have to play the odds, so to speak. I One of the biggest misconceptions or some of the worst advice I hear from people giving on my Facebook group is do the writing first. No, 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 no. Do not. You do the multiple choice first. Why? Because 80% of your score comes from that. You can actually pass the exam with a really strong multiple choice and a very weak constructed response, but you cannot pass it the other way around. Okay, very important. Now, I also recommend that you take these in order. Now, you can prepare however you want, but when it comes to testing, you take subtest one. This is the way I, I like to say it. So let's say that you are joining my course. You decide that you want to follow my plan and structure and, and all of that. I would suggest you go through the digital course content. Um, I lay out a study planner that gives you about three weeks to do that. You can actually squish it depending on how much time you have and still stay on track. So you would do all the digital content for subtest one, and then you would come in and join us for a workshop. Then any time after the workshop, you're ready to test. If you're feeling confident, you're ready to test. While you're waiting for your results for subtest one to come in, you start prepping for two. Same thing, you start that digital course content, you join us for a workshop, and you test any time after that workshop. While you're waiting for your results here for subtest two, you're going to have received your subtest one results. 
The goal is that you pass and you move on to three. But if you don't pass one, you come back and start prepping for one again. This is the way that I recommend that you do it. Something to note, when you don't pass, you have a 45-day wait period. Now, did you see how many days we have left? 225? You do not have a lot of time to have to retake, right? I always tell people, don't take this exam if you're not feeling prepared. You've got to feel prepared. Um, so that is something to make note of. All right, so what passes? An individual test uh, score of 220 is passing. So if you look here at this particular, this is a score report. You can see once you pass a subtest in the written exam, it's done. You're, you're a third of the way done. So this person here is actually two thirds of the way done. They passed the first subtest and they passed the third one. They took them all on the same day. I never recommend that. Some people can do it. They must be much younger and more energetic than I because there is no way I could do it. Um, but what you will see here is if you pass, you will not know what your score is. If you do not pass, you will receive a number. Um, the closer the number to 220, the better prepared you are. To be very honest with you, a score under 200 is not close. It's not close at all. You have got to really reevaluate and hit the books and start fresh, okay? If you're in that 210 range, you're doing pretty close. The 215s, you're right there. The 219s kill me, man. It's like one point. They just kill me. Um, and I've never seen a, a score challenge win. You can challenge a score, but I always recommend save your money. I've never seen one win in all these years. You will also see your, your um, performance indices indicated by plus signs. You can earn up to four pluses in each of these areas, and these are for the constructed responses. So threes are good, but you're still leaving points on the table because you can get four. Fours are great. Twos are adequate. Um, they're not, actually, they're not adequate, I don't think. They're, no, they are considered adequate. Um, twos are, are they limited? Ones are limited. I can't remember. There's, there's a breakdown for that. So remember that 80% of your score comes from the multiple choice. The constructed responses and the case study only count for 20%. Very big, important thing to remember. Okay, any questions so far? I'm going to turn my heater off here real quick. Okay, we'll take plenty of questions at the end, but if you have a question, you are welcome to just raise that little electronic hand and let me address that with you. Okay, so where do you start? Most of you, as actually about half of you when we did the poll before we started, were brand new to this. So where do you start? You can review the content specifications that are available on the CDC website. It's going to show you all of the things that you need to know, but it can be very overwhelming. When I created my course, I actually went through all of those content specifications with a fine tooth comb and I created the course around it because rather than knowing every single little thing that the content specifications ask for, we focus on learning the things that are going to give you the most bang for your buck and knowing them really, really well. That's how you pass. I also strongly urge you to read the National Reading Panel Report. Now, the National Reading Panel Report is available on my website for free. Um, with It's on my recommended resources page. I'm going to drop it here in the chat for you. Let me tell you a little bit about the National Reading Panel Report. This report was written and published um, in 2000. No, yes, in the year 2000. The RECA was born in 2001 or 2002, I believe. The RECA is a direct result of the findings of the National Reading Panel Report. 
The National Reading Panel Report is a meta-analysis of hundreds of um, research projects or whatever they did, their studies, in order to learn how students learn to read, what teachers could teach in order to expedite that process. The result is the report. The summary report is about, I think, I can't remember if it's like 48 pages or 58 pages. It's the summary report. The full report is like 200 pages. Don't read that. It's, it's jargony and it's too difficult. The summary report was written for teachers and parents, and it's meant to tell you what we need to teach and how we need to teach it. The questions from the RECA are coming directly from the National Reading Panel report, a lot of them. And what this report will do is help you pull all of this together to understand how reading develops and how to teach it. And that's the goal. Remember, you got to know the content, and this is going to be a really important first start for you. So read that report, please. I also strongly urge you, and I recognize I'm biased, join my course. This course has helped hundreds and hundreds of teachers just like you pass the RECA. We, if you're in our Facebook group, you can read the testimonials. I encourage you to Google me, Google RECA Prep 101, and read the almost 200 five-star reviews that we have. Um, listen to other people who have can vouch for me because it has been just a really great support and program to help people get through. And again, we don't we focus on learning the content. I actually teach you to be how to teach. I teach you how to teach reading. And through that, you pass the RECA. Um, there are only two uh, books that I recommend using. And in fact, if you have other books, get rid of them because too many resources can be overwhelming and you'll start getting contradictory information. The Ready for Rika, James Zarillo book, the Dr. Zarillo book, it's the blue book. Doesn't matter which edition, that book is great. The Cliff Notes book, it's the yellow book that is written. I like the Cliff Notes book better because it gives you a really good um, content structure, but it also has practice questions. And I think the practice questions in the, in the Cliff Notes book is better than the CDC's practice questions. So that is, and I use both of those books in my study planner to help prepare you. So I would recommend those. And then if you do decide to join the course as a member, or you just need one subtest to complete, I encourage you to attend our live workshops. They are awesome. They are anywhere from four and a half to six hours long. Um, and these these workshops are designed, again, to teach you the content. Like, I don't just tell you, hey, you need to know this, this, and this. No, you could do that by looking at the content specifications. I teach you the content. It's a lot of visuals. There's a lot of embedded video clips in there that we break down. It's very interactive. Um, they're, they're pretty awesome. So I, I hope to see you at one of those someday. Now, inside of my course, I cover everything. It covers the subtest structure for every single subtest. I give you an overview of reading development, covers all the competencies, all the domains. We have, uh, there are videos, it's, it's all asynchronous. Videos and content for the case study and the constructed responses. There are videos of me doing sample test deconstruction to help you know how to tackle the multiple choice um, questions. I've also extracted all of the audio and put it into a podcast format so you can listen to it on the go. So it covers, it's very comprehensive. It is not, I keep. People will ask me, well, can I just buy like the subtest one part? Nope, it's not packaged that way. It's kind of an all, all or nothing type of thing. And I do want to talk a little bit more about the workshops. So workshops are live supplemental Zoom sessions, very much like right now. There's a slide deck. There's me talking. You're here. There's the chat going and we have questions. Um, they last for, you know, up to six hours. And we cover all of the content that is inside of the digital course. 
the content doesn't change. The delivery of it changes because depending on how interactive the audience is with the questions, we go really deep into that. I embed a number of sample um, videos from YouTube showing people teaching these things and we break all of that down. So this allows us to go into deeper discussion, um, lots of time for questioning, and you get the benefit of meeting others that are going through the same thing. You'll find out people that are teaching the same thing as you are, struggling with similar things. We have spontaneous study groups that kind of develop in there with other people as they're connecting in the chat. It's pretty awesome. And so the workshops, again, are supplemental. So depending, and you don't have to do them. Like the digital course, for, for many people, they just do the digital course and that's fine. Some people really love the workshops because their study sessions are scheduled and they have, they're kind of forced to be there at a time rather than, oh, I think I'll go through this domain, you know, um, at home if I, if I have time. So it's a little more focused than that. Um, I'm going to go through the membership options, and this will make more sense. But if you are a member, either a VIP or a standard member, you can join any workshop for $47. If you are a non-member, like you're like, I only have one workshop or one subtest left. I don't need the whole membership. You could just come in on a workshop for $97. And if you decide to become a platinum member, you can attend as many workshops as you want for free. There is no additional cost. It's kind of like you, you pay for the everything up front. Um, workshops are not recorded. People always ask me that. Well, I want to go, but no, because the ses the course is already recorded. Um, so I don't record the workshops. You have to be there live to participate in those. And another nice thing about the course is um, there's a mobile app. So Kajabi is the name of my web host. Uh, they've just recently rebranded. So this is the icon or the avatar that you'll see, icon avatar. I don't know if I'm using the term right. But Kajabi is the name of my web host. And this is where my course is housed. And so you can go to the App Store, Google Play store, whatever it may be, and download this app for free. And then you can log in. And so if you're on your phone or your desktop, laptop, whatever, all of your content will sync. And so you can pick up wherever you may want. Okay. So these are the course options. I got a sneeze coming if I, okay. <sighs> okay. Um, there are a number of different options that I've created to try to help for, for whatever your situation may be. So a standard member is uh, 127, and this will be through June. And this covers everything that I've talked about. The difference here between the standard and the VIP is all memberships come with all of the digital content, okay, and the podcast and everything. The difference comes in if you want me to read and critique your writing or if you want to attend the workshops. Those are the differences. So a standard member is invited to workshops, but each workshop costs $47, which is like less than $10 an hour. Um these, you can earn up to one unit of credit as a standard member if you come to each of the workshops, subtest one, two, and three. So there's uh, one of the units is for the workshop series. This is, let's see, the VIP membership is the same as the standard except I will give you personal feedback on your writing. So if you want to share your case study with me, if you want to write your constructive responses and get my feedback, I will personally read those and critique them. You share them with me as a Google Doc, I write all over them and then send them back to you. A VIP member can earn up to two more units. The VIP and the Platinum can earn the two units for completing the digital course and sharing a case study with me. That proves that you did that part. And then, again, the VIP the workshops are $47. The Platinum member is everything. It is 
it you get all the digital content. You can come to as many workshops as you want, and you're not bound by deadlines. I send you the link. If your Saturday opens up, you join us. You have to register, but registration is free. Okay, so it's some people just like the I don't want to keep having to you know pay that sort of thing. So this is their their deal here. We also have a monthly membership. So maybe you're like you know that's kind of a big chunk of money right now. And you could do $47 a month. There is no discount. I do like to, as a thank you for those of you who join me live, I like to offer you a 10% discount on any of these three memberships here. So I want you to write down this code. This is NewbieQ1117. It's the date that we have this, this webinar. And if you join before Wednesday, or it will expire Wednesday, so you can get any one of these minus 10%, okay? Now, if you're doing the math, if you wanted to, the platinum membership is most cost effective if you're going to come to at least the three workshops. It's just more, more cost effective um, because this plus 47 plus 47 plus 47 works out more than 297, plus you're getting a discount for these. So. Whatever works for you, if that is something that you are interested in, I'm, I'm writing the, um, the code in the chat for you so that you can copy that, okay? That is NewbieQ1117. Again, if you forget the number, it's the date. I always put the date in it, okay? Any questions about any of these before we, I keep going? Are you sure? Robert, you look like you got one right there. Are you good, sir? Um, I'm all, yes, I'm okay. Okay. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm coming back into teaching. I was taking care of my daughters. And, and um, now I'm able to start teaching again. Um, I haven't taken the RECA since 2008. I almost passed it. I just missed it by one point. Now, the Eureka, do you take all three sets at one time like we did before? No. They're oh. all in, they're broken down into subtests, which is better. Wow. Yeah, okay. way better. They did that a couple of years ago. Yes, okay. That's right. I found out. So that's why I'm curious. Yes, yes. Okay. It's, uh, it's a much better deal for all of you guys. Trust me. Yeah. Yeah, very stressful. Yes, I <laughs> you know. Right, right, right. Lindsay, okay. do you have a question, sweetie? Um, well, yeah, I was just thinking I was looking at um, it says access to the course for one full year, but we really only you really have don't. Yeah. 225 days. <laughs> you have to. Yeah. So you have access for 225 days. So I, was, I was just thinking it in my head. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. <laughs> so and, and, you know, so there are a couple of ways that you can actually get your memberships paid for. And these have um, been used by other members in the past. And I want to share these with you. First of all, the, the way I teach you this content, this is professional development. You will be learning how to teach reading, which actually means that it can come out of Title II PD money from your schools. And so what I did is I created a, an email template that you are welcome to copy and give, uh, make any adjustments to fit your need and then share that with your administrator and see if they will reimburse you or if they will cover your membership. So that is one way that has been helpful for people to offset the cost, because quite honestly, um, you're learning a lot and it will benefit your instruction, trust me. Another way, and this one was brand new, I recently had a member who got us paid for through Donors Choose. And so if you go into the Facebook group, um, there is, if you look up Donors Choose, you'll see the details here, but Kelly was able to have donors choose paved for her membership. And we wrote it all down in how that was done inside of the Facebook group. If you've never used donors choose to get 
something for your classroom. It's a great organization. I have had several things funded through them, and they do cover professional development. This is just the information I've already dropped it in the chat about the units, but remember that the units, in order to get two units for completing the digital course, this is only available to a VIP or a platinum member, and that's because you have to share a case study with me um, in order to do, to do that. Any membership can earn a single unit by attending each of the workshops, which um, at least the one, two, and three, and you can earn a unit. All units, the fees are for Teachers College of San Joaquin. They are 95 a unit now. And so the information is in the, the PDF or the document that I already dropped in the chat for you. And I always publish my calendars on my website and inside of the Facebook group. You can search the Facebook group for calendar. It's always there. I pin them to the top, or you can go to the very bottom of my website, and they're all there. So you can see every workshop has an enrollment window. Enrollment is open for eight days. Um, I only I create these, these offers in the checkout pages one at a time. So in order to attend a workshop, you are you have to join through during that membership, I'm sorry, during that enrollment window, unless you're a platinum member. Platinum members can come anytime, but if you're a VIP, a monthly, or a standard, you have to register during the enrollment window. So you can see right now we are open for subtest three. Our next workshop is subtest three, which is happening this Saturday. And so I do this, what's going to happen is in two weeks, um, the subtest one workshop is coming around, which is why I time this newbie Q&A, because that gives you time to complete the digital content before our next workshop. Um, so always pay attention. Our subtest one workshop enrollment will open on the 27th. And you can see that our subtest one is six hours long. It, it's really heavy. And so we break it into two days. So it's going to be on two Saturday mornings from 8 to 11. The enrollment will close on December 5th. But something else happening in December is what we call a boot camp. A boot camp is when I do all of the workshops in six days. So we break, it's like the cram session. Why do I do that? Because you guys are on vacation and I know I was a teacher for 27 years. I know that you are studying during your vacations. And so what I do is I, I, we get them all done. And so this is going to be coming up. You'll start seeing, um, information and invitations coming out right after our subtest one workshop. But this is a good time to come in and um, get it all, honestly. So, and I always tell people repetition is the key to mastery. Let me say that again. Repetition is the key to mastery. Anybody can learn anything. It just depends on how many repetitions you need. And so coming to a workshop more than once, watching the digital content more than once is super beneficial. And so I give you opportunities to do that. We usually do our, our workshops about every other week, unless we have a boot camp. you can see we're kind of cramming it all in there. And I do not have January's calendar ready to go yet. Any questions about those? I have a question. Yeah. Hi, Angela. Hi. Um, I'm sorry to cut you off. I was I just know. wondering if your boot camp pricing differs um, yep. from the regular workshop right here. Oh, I'm sorry. Nope. So if you decide there is a discounted member fee of 127 for the whole thing, which is, it's a reduction of that 47. Yes, that is to join all of them, but you can still just attend individual ones. Like you're like, well, I only need subtest one. Great. That's 47 bucks. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Okay. So I want to say just a little bit about the video option because tomorrow night at the same time, I'm going to be doing a webinar very similar to the, to this, but it's going to cover the video option of the exam. And we've already had one um, sub or I'm sorry, one submission. And I will say of everybody that I in the course, because I have a course to support it. And I have not heard of anybody in my course yet that didn't pass. That's pretty exciting. Who submitted? We had a hand, we had, I think about a dozen or so submit. I haven't heard yet. Of course, maybe, you know, we never know, but the results have been really good. We have about an 80 to 85% pass rate of the video option course. The next submission is March 6th, which everybody is getting ready for. There's a webinar tomorrow night, same time. Now, I do not recommend the video as a first attempt of the RECA ever. And I don't recommend the video for many people at all. So it, this is not something you want to go into blind, which is why I'm having another webinar tomorrow to tell people a, a little bit about that one. But it could be an option for you if you have your own class. Um, there are some exceptions, though, if you are a mod severe SPED teacher. It's, that is probably not a good um, may not be the best environment to demonstrate the competencies of the RECA. If you have attempted the written several times and have not had any luck, if you need more time, if you're really a good writer, um, and if you can pay attention to detail in your writing, this might be a good option for you. And I'll get into that tomorrow if you're interested in joining that one. Okay, so... RECA Prep 101 might be the right approach for you if you think that you need a sequential asynchronous approach to studying for this exam and at a time when you have time, right? When I was going through grad school, I was writing my, my master's thesis um, at 4 a.m. because I had toddlers at home. I, so I know what it's like to have the family and try to do all of these things all at once. Um, so the asynchronous can be helpful in giving you that because you can study anytime you want. If you are a visual learner and you need to see examples, this is a great option for you. Inside of any RECA prep book that I've read, there are no pictures and I try to make it really visual to show you what these things are. If you need a mentor that you can rely on and reach out to, um, that's why I'm here. It is just me. I've been doing this all these years and it's just me. You email me, that's who you're going to get. It's going to be me. I sometimes talk people down from the testing center. I get these crazy Facebook messages. Emily, I'm freaking out. <laughs> so I'll talk you off a cliff if I need to. Um, if you like the option of attending a live workshop with other test takers, this is great for you. If you think that that idea of the podcast, so you can listen on your commute to work, perfect. And if you want the option of actually earning professional development units, while you're studying, that's how you make more money as a teacher. You've got to max out your units and get all the way over on your salary schedule as soon as possible. So it could be the right option for you. But I do want to take a moment and talk about your mindset, first of all. Um, I, I'm really passionate about this. I'm passionate about literacy and teaching kids to read. And so... I, I need you to evaluate where you are in your headspace. If you are coming into the RECA with a chip on your shoulder, you're angry that you have to take it, you think that, well, this is just another way for California to get my money and this, is, this doesn't measure how I am as a teacher, I want you to stop right now. First of all, you have to show competency in what you are teaching. If you were going in for brain surgery, I bet you would want a brain surgeon that has passed a competency exam, right? Your kids, our kids deserve no less than that. We have to, if we are going to have a profession that is respected, we have to hold ourselves to high standards. And that means that, yeah, you're gonna have to pass a competency exam. And teaching a kid to read is the single most important thing that you will do throughout your career. It is 
everything to their future. If they can read, their future is bright. And if they can't, it is very, very dark. And you, my friend, are the one that is the gatekeeper. And how well you teach it determines how well they learn it. So before you jump into this, I want you to dig deep and realize that this work is important. And if that doesn't resonate with you, I may not be the right person for you because I am absolutely about holding you to a high standard so that you can be an amazing teacher. Y'all got into this business because you love kids and because you want to work with kids and you want to change their future. And this is how you start doing it. So shift your mindset about the Rika. The Rika is the hurdle that proves that you have the competence to do what you need to do. I will show you every step of the way, I promise, but this is important. So before we close this part out, I want you to remember that the Rika is not easy. You are going to have to study. Some of you are going to have to study a lot. And we focus on learning the content. That's what's important. Not just the terms, not just the practice tests. Those are important, but you have to understand how all of it works together. If you're a SPED teacher, I recommend jump into a primary classroom, go visit a good classroom and see this in action. There's a lot of content there um, or a lot of information that you can glean from a really good first grade teacher. Brush up on your writing skills. You do have to write. And if you decide to join me, I promise I will, I will lead you every step of the way. And if you check out my YouTube channel, I mostly serve um, my reading interventionist audience as I coach and consult with them. So there's a ton of videos about reading. There are some specific to the RECA, but not many. Um, and I'm also on Instagram. I'm, I'm not real prominent there, but you're welcome to follow me there. And I know that it feels impossible, especially when you've got a countdown hanging over your shoulder, but it's, you're going to get there and you absolutely will. You've got to put in the work. It always seems impossible until it's done. And if you would like to see inside of the course, I am going to stop the recording. I'll take you inside of the course and answer any additional questions.